Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee? The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women, because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away, wondering to himself what had happened. May God bless the reading and hearing of his holy word. Let us pray. Lord, we do ask that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts are acceptable and pleasing in your sight. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> my husband and I were walking the dogs one day, and I was thinking about this sermon. I had been looking up absurd truths on the internet. Absurd truths. You know, I figured I'd get a few hits. How about 38 million? There are a lot of absurd truths out there, or at least what people claim to be absurd. So I decided that I was going to try a couple on him. Big mistake. Randy is one of these guys who needs to see it to believe it. And even if he's not sure, especially if I'm telling it to him, he needs to verify it for himself. Okay, so you know, I thought, well, maybe this time will be different. So I'll try it one, just one of these weird things on him. And guess what? Right away, he began peppering me with, how do you know these truths are true? Can you prove it? What's your source? How do they know? Of course I couldn't prove that it rains diamonds on Jupiter. Of course I can't prove that a cloud weighs 1.1 million pounds. There are a lot of things that I believe that I can't prove. But I thought that they might just be true because of the number of sources. The women in the resurrection story were no different when it came to talking to the apostles. They were not met with any better, wow, really? This is true? Than I was. The man said, Shh, hogwash, utter nonsense. You're off your board. Not one of them believed the good news that the women had said. You know, because there was no expectation that Jesus was going to rise from the grave. There was none. <laughs> Not a, nothing. Nobody expected it to happen. The women were not there to see the risen Christ. They were there to anoint a dead body. And even Peter, disciple number one, numero uno Peter, didn't understand it. He raced to the tomb, saw that it was empty, but now what? He had no idea. One of our youth recently asked his mom, what if it's not true? What if it's not an absurd truth, but what if it's just plain old absurd? It's a very good question. That young man was not the first, and nor will he be the last to wonder. And some of you here this morning may be wondering the same thing. And, as Pastor Dick showed you, it was a question that the Apostle Paul had to address in his first letter to the church in Corinth. But I want you to listen again to what, if this is not true, where we stand. If Christ has not been raised, my preaching is useless. Good for nothing, but so is your faith. If Christ has not been raised, not only is your faith futile, worth nothing, but you're still in your sins. That means that nothing can do, you can do to take away the sin, the stain that you have, if he's not been raised. You are still in your sins. And not only that, those who have fallen asleep, those who have died, those who have gone before us, where are they? They don't have the promise of eternal life because Christ has not been raised. And so, and then Paul has a kicker. He said, if only in this life we have hope in Christ, we should be pitied. Nobody should be pitied more than we 
are if it's not true. You think about it. That's a very bleak picture if it's not true. We don't need to be here. Our faith is useless. Our prayers don't get answered. We're still in sin. We have no opportunity for a relationship with God. There are no promises of life after this. And yet, Paul knows that even though it's absurd, it's the truth. Because in the next sentence he proclaims that Christ indeed has been raised from the dead. Paul knew it because he had met the risen Lord. He wasn't expecting it either, but he found it to be true. And he spent the rest of his life proclaiming that truth to the world. You see, I may not always be able to prove that Jesus is alive in ways that our tech-savvy, scientific Big Bang theorists of the 21st century would like to have that kind of proof. That's why we need faith. We need faith because God is greater, a greater mystery in some respects, greater power, greater everything than we are. And so he's not going to be able to be proved beyond a shadow of a doubt, but he wants us to have faith. And you know what? Not only that, but he's not saying that the faith has to be this huge, glorious, grand thing. Size of a mustard seed. You know how little those are? He says that your faith is the size of a mustard seed. If you believe in my son's resurrection, faith the size of a mustard seed, you can move mountains, you can do all kinds of things because God values our faith. God values the fact that we trust in him. Jesus in another section says, Blessed are those who've never seen me who yet believe. That's us, folks. Woohoo! That is us! Because Christ has been risen from the dead. You see, there is evidence of Jesus' life and his death. There is scripture which foretold and continues to proclaim God's loving good news. And then there's that absurd reality that these 11, skeptical though they are, are going to change the world through their proclamation of the good news of Jesus Christ that continues to today. What made the difference? These 11 guys did not believe the women. Peter left the empty tomb wondering because they encountered the risen Lord. The cross was empty, the tomb was empty, but Jesus is alive. You see, none of this really made sense to the women or to the men until they encountered the risen Christ for themselves. And when they did, they realized that everything that they had heard, all that they had seen, all they had witnessed with him was in fact true. Sin has been defeated. We can be forgiven all of our sins. Death no longer has any final word here. God has the final word, and he says that we are his beloved children, and he wants to be with us both now and forever. Evil does not rule. Jesus does. Love does. Even though it may not look like it some days, we can make our lives, our very lives, on the fact that Evil doesn't win. Jesus does. God does. And the best thing of all is that we can have a relationship, an intimate relationship with the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, because of what Jesus has done. You know, I will never, I'm thinking, in this lifetime, be able to convince Randy of any of the absurd truths that I read about. That's okay. Because it doesn't really matter. The truth about Jesus rising from the dead, however, does matter. It's mattered for the past 2,000 years, and it will continue to matter into eternity. That Easter morning, the women didn't need to see Jesus to believe. They believed the source, the two men in white clothes, and they remembered Jesus' words of promise. His promises are good today, just as they were 2,000 years ago. And the good news is that we too can encounter the risen Christ. We meet him in the Lord's Supper when we feast at the heavenly feast. We meet him when we converse with him in prayer, when we bring our longings and our needs, but also our gratitude and our thanksgiving to him. We can engage him in worship. He is in this place right here, right now. 
in Scripture, in the proclamation of the Word. All of these places, God is here, and He wants to engage us. And we can encounter Him in the lives of, of fellow Christians. We are Christ to each other as we love Him and love our neighbor as well as ourselves. We can also become part of His body, which is the church. And earlier today, Laura and Nathan Mahaffey did that at the sunrise service. And Rocky and Kelsey and Dick and Susan are going to be doing that this morning. You see, this is a day of rejoicing. Jesus is alive. He has risen from the dead, just as he said. Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Woohoo! Oh, come on! <laughs> All right. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Now I would like to invite Raquel Baker, Kelsey Dameron, Dick Poisington and Susan Poisington to come on down. Jesus Christ.